So I'm Buffy with STEM. Some of you have done live programs with me in the past where I am actually present at your library or in the communities. So this is a new experience for me. I am very much a hands-on instructor uh, participant. So hopefully between the chat and where you guys are at home, we'll be able to work through this and have a successful and good project. Um, it's really weird for me to be teaching to a camera and knowing that you guys are out there without any feedback. So um, if you do have a question or something comes up that I've missed or you just are really excited about part of your, your program, your project, how it's turning out, definitely use the Q&A or the chat so that we get some response back and I can tell and make sure that everybody's moving along at a good speed. So yeah, super excited about this. Like Heather mentioned, uh, there are some additional kits available that when we, uh, after the live feed posts uh, via the Facebook page, there will be um, an open, I'm trying to think what, what they refer to that, but anyway, basically an open registration up to 75 so that people can go back and link into the videos and have access to it. So with that, um, everybody has already picked up their kit. And at home, you guys would have pulled out your flour sack dish towel and your glue. And per the instructions in the kit and watching the video, hopefully you guys have already created some kind of amazing pattern on your flour sack dish towel. So the pattern that I'm gonna to use today is one of the original ones that I created. So it's very simple. It just has some swirls and this particular uh, one, it'll be kind of fun to see how the colors turn out. So this is the stage that you should be at today is with a pattern created on your dish towel that is already dry. If your pattern is not created or yours isn't dry, just set that to the side and we'll still walk you through the instructions so that you can come back later and work on your project. But you'll definitely want to create your design before you start working with the dye. So also inside of your kit, you're gonna need and pull out a variety of different things. Um, there's gonna be a plastic bag. One of the things that I do from the very, very beginning, your plastic bag is you know kind of probably wadded up. I fold down the top lip because then it makes it easier to get my dye project in without getting dye all over the outside of the bag. And then I'm just gonna set that off to the side because I'm not gonna need that for a while. If you're really worried about, you know, dye getting on your hands, um, there are some gloves. I won't actually probably use the gloves because I feel better having a more tactile experience. Other things that you're gonna pull out are three containers like this with the lids, and that's what we're gonna use to mix our dyes in. You should also have foam brushes. You'll have three packets of dye. One is a navy blue. One is a robin egg blue, and then this one is a chartreuse green. So you'll have those three little packets of dye, and you will also have a little packet that is full of these little white beads, and this is actually dried urea. Um, aside from that, things that you will want to do in preparation that were not in the kit, you'll notice that I am sitting at a table, and I've covered the surface with a vinyl tablecloth, so in some way you need to protect your surface, whether you put down like a plastic garbage bag or a vinyl tablecloth, that works really good. And then on top of that, to help keep down the mess of the dye, I just put a layer of paper towels. So I just, you know, rolled off some paper towel. That's um, kind of a, you know, throw away the mess. Typically, because I do a lot of these dye projects, I have some old towels that I just reuse over and over and they absorb all the dyes. So that's what I like to work on is just um, an old towel. And at the end of the day, um, sometimes I actually even buy new towels. And at the end of the day, I get these really cool, crazy dye patterns on them and they look kind of funky. So I'm gonna give you guys a minute or so to make sure that you've got a work surface covered and you've either put down paper towel or found an old towel to put down. And along with that, um, grab some water. You can get it just right out of the tap and make sure that it's kind of warm. You don't want it to be cold. Uh, you can heat it up a little bit or just, just have warm tap water is great. 
So with that, I'm going to kind of give you a minute or so. And while you guys are gathering those things together, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what batiking is. So batiking is a type of resistant dye. So you create a pattern creating some type of or you use some type of a medium that creates a resist against the dye. So traditionally, batiking is always done with wax. And through the years, there have been a lot of different wax-based products that uh, people have used. And sometimes the wax causes a lot of grief because you create the pattern in wax, but then at the end, you have to remove that wax. So today, we are actually going to do a very modernized version of that. And you guys created your pattern using a washable glue. Um, there's a couple of things in the washable glue department that come up. This particular pattern that I'm going to be sharing with you today was created, and I don't know if you can see very well. Um, I'll get it as close to the camera as I can. It's created with a gel glue. And this particular pattern is created with the washable glue that you guys had in your kits. And the reason why I'm showing you both is that both are really great products to use. The reason you didn't get the gel was because it was not available in bulk quantities in the size that we needed. The only real difference is that the blue gel allows you to see your pattern a little more clearly while you're putting it down on the white. So it's not white on white, you have that little bit of tint. So that allows a little bit of variation. And the gel, when you go to wash it out, I found I had to kind of actually agitate it a little bit, um, use a little scraper to kind of pry a little bit of it off. It doesn't seem to wash out as easily as the washable glue. So both are really great products to use and certainly both are acceptable for the, the no uh, wax fatigue. But fatiguing, like I said, is where you create a resist, something that will not accept the dye. And traditionally it's done with um, stamps that are either made out of copper or wood. Uh, you can use a jaunting tool and you're limited sometimes to the tool that you use to create the pattern. So with the glue um, or the, the traditional jaunting tool, you can be the artist and freeform create. So hopefully you guys have created some beautiful patterns. It would be fun to see some of your finished products um, and patterns. It's really challenging because I don't get to see anything that you guys are doing. You're just limited to, to my terrible art. Um, okay, so hopefully by now you guys have all um, you know, got your work surface covered, you've got a towel down, or you've put some paper towels, something to, to kind of protect, protect. So now we need to mix the dyes. So go ahead and put your three containers um, you know, kind of in front of you. And the first thing that you're gonna want to put in them is your urea. So this is um, a dry form of the urea. And you're just gonna wanna open that up and evenly distribute that into thirds. So you're gonna put just a third of, and this is, you know, you're just estimating. Um, so if you get a little, you know, you don't have to hand count the beads out or anything. You know, just kind of estimate that you're getting, you know, about the same quantity in each of these containers. Hey, Buffy. So like I'm with you. Mm -hmm. um, so we have some questions quick. So somebody okay. wants to know if the dye powder is non-toxic. Okay, so the dye that we're using is a Procyon dye. And you do not want to like inhale that because it, it's a dry dye form. And um, once it's in the liquid form, it is non-toxic. Okay. Um, and then do you think the dye will mark a laminated wood table? I would not take that risk. I would definitely put something on top of it, uh, even if it's a garbage bag. And then the other because dye. Sorry, keep going. Oh, I was gonna say dye. Dye permeates through everything, and because it's so liquid, um, I mean, even a little drop of it is just gonna go a long way. Okay. And then the last question um, I can answer too. Um, the question is: Can't we email a photo or post on Facebook? Yes, you can post in the comments of. Um, the live 
um, the live video, or you can message it to us. Um, and before we are done today, I'll uh, go ahead and put, um, well, actually you should have the, I can put my email in the, in the chat, but you should have my email um, from the registration uh, email that you got. And then also the, the follow-up email with the uh, Zoom link in it. So you can go ahead and, and send me an email, um, our Buffy an email. Uh, so yes, you can do any of those, any of those things. Yeah, that would be great. And a lot of times what I try to do is take a picture of the before and the after project. So, you know, take a picture of your, your towel with the pattern on it and then um, show us what it looked like afterwards. And then that way we get kind of, you know, both visions of what you created artistically with just your glue pattern and then what you chose to do with it in the dye process. Okay, so you guys should have your urea, um, you know, measured out, uh, distributed into the three different um, containers. And then go ahead and just, this is just warm water. And I'm just gonna go ahead and fill that. And I'm gonna fill it about to the bottom mark. Um, I might stop just a little bit short. The so warm water one is more, going to help. One okay, more, go ahead. Sorry, because I was, I was looking at those questions. I actually, I missed it. I'm assuming it's the little white um, like balls that we're putting in there. Yeah, the little white balls are the dry urea. And you're just, it's, it's pre-measured out to give you enough to put into the three. So you're just going to kind of subdivide that into three. And, it, and it's not an exact science on that one. You can be a little bit, um, you know, if you get a little more in one and a little less in the other, you'll be okay. So um, you can use the, the end of your, your sticks. And with the warm water, uh, we're, what we're wanting to do, kind of like dissolving jello, is just kind of to get that urea to dissolve. Can, Buffy, can you please repeat how much water for um, some of the... So I didn't do an exact quantity, like I didn't say two cups. In your container, there's a, a ridge on it that has lines and you're just gonna fill to the bottom of that line. I didn't want people to have to run and get a measuring cup and something, something different. Um, so we chose um, containers that would work really well for the size and quantity that we wanted. Okay, so as you can see with the warm water, the urea should almost all be dissolved. So the dye that we're using is a powdered form of a Procyon dye. If you're at all worried about, you know, getting it, you know, in your lungs or anything like that, definitely make sure that you put a mask on. And since we're in COVID season, everybody should be able to have good access to a mask. So this is my navy blue. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pour that into one of the vats. This is my robin egg blue. and chartreuse green. And then I'm gonna take a dedicated uh, sponge brush and go ahead and stir that up. So I get all the powdered mixed in. And I'm gonna leave that brush with that particular dye and do the same with each of the other ones. So I'm just speaking uh, from my own experience over here, but apparently I'm a very slow stirrer. So <laughs> just in case anybody else is That's all right. as slow as I am, I might need some extra time. Yep, we'll take some time. And now that I don't have any powder, 
I'm gonna go ahead and remove my mask so it's easier for you guys to hear and understand me. And then I'm very carefully going to move my dies off my work area to the side. I like to set mine on the lid so that it has a little bit of a drip surface. I'm not always as tidy as I would like to be, you know? Sometimes you have overage, you know, drippage that happens. So I don't know if you can see that where I just sat it on top of the lid, like so. Okay, so while I've got that seated, this would be a good time to put your gloves on if you're choosing to use your gloves. And then go ahead and get your patterned flower sack dish towel out. I'm gonna set mine right here. Now, my work table is a little bit shy of the width that I need it to be. So what you wanna be careful of is when you're working on that edge to make sure it doesn't drip down. If it drips down, then you're gonna end up getting it on the floor or potentially on your clothes. So just kind of, you know, be aware of that. I'm just so going to- So one of the other cool things to think about, um, you know, I don't know which side you chose to glue. It really actually doesn't matter if you're gonna have the glue side up or the glue side down because in the process we're gonna flip and we're actually going to dye both sides. So I usually start with my glue side up just because it has the raised finish and, but in batiking both with wax and glue, because it's a resist, it's blocking the fabric or the fiber from both sides. It's blocking all the way through. And that's why it doesn't matter if you set it down, glue side up or glue side down. One other thing to note, I actually had a patron come in today and she and her granddaughter were really excited. They're gonna be participating and they went out and bought a bunch of other uh, dish towels to do and some other dyes. But all, all of the dish towels that you guys have received were pre-treated with soda ash. And what the soda ash does is it's a mordant and it sets the dye into the fabric. We are also using 100% cotton, which again, creates the vibrancy of the dye into the fabric. If you use like a percentage, you're gonna get less and less of the dye to adhere to the fiber. So we're working with 100% cotton flour sack dish towels that have been pre-treated with a product called Soda Ash. And you can find that available, I, I order online. Um, I don't know where everyone lives. I, obviously throughout the, the library system, but I live in a pretty rural area. And so I order everything online. Bob, um, you get a request just to wait for- I'm gonna go ahead and move. And then- Say that again? We got a request to wait for a minute, but then we got another question that is, where do you, okay. find, where do you find soda ash? Can you explain how to treat the fabric? So maybe you can explain that. And then by the time you're done, we can move on. Great, so I, I do buy my soda ash online. Um, Amazon is a great uh, tool. Dharma Trading is probably my favorite dye uh, resource. So the soda ash, you can buy it by pound, by the pound, like one pound, five pounds, um, because I typically do large books. I order like 25 pounds at a time as you hear. What you're gonna do is you're gonna fill like a tub of water. So typically I will do well, so I did 300 towels for this and I, you know, five gallon bucket full of warm water and I took the warm water. Um, the reason why you want it warm is it just helps the soda ash dissolve a lot quicker. So it doesn't have to be steaming hot. Again, just, you know, warm water from your tap. So depending on how big of a project you're doing, say you're just going to do, you know, two or three dish towels, you might just get like a, a little container, like a, a Cool Whip container, one of the the big uh, cottage cheese container, something like that, fill it full of water. And then you're gonna put about a half a cup of the soda ash in that and stir it until it dissolves. And then I wet my fabric down, like I'll just take the dish towels to the sink and run them under, like I might even have water in there and, and I'll, I'll get them wet before I stick them in the soda ash. That way they get pre-treated all the way through. 
Um, so I get them wet, I wring that fabric out, and then I stick it in my soda ash water. And I let them set anywhere from, you know, 20 minutes to an hour. Sometimes I forget about them because I'm doing other things. I come back to it. I wring them out. I will even run them through the drain cycle on my wash machine. And then I, I hang them out to dry. And so all of your towels were pre-treated with that. And the difference being, so you can see behind me, these were projects that were done with the towels treated in soda ash. The one that I demoed in the other video, my towel didn't get pre-treated with soda ash. And you can see the difference in the dye. So this is a much muted color. So same dyes, just a difference in vibrancy of how the dye picked up because the soda ash um, is that mordant that allows it to adhere. So just kind of to, to give you you know, an idea on what happens to the coloring. Buffy, can we do the hey, coloring if the glue is a little wet? I would not, okay. because once you continue to add the moisture of the dye, your glue is just gonna continue to seep. So, I mean, you could certainly play with it. That's part of the fun, I think, of doing any dye project is no two dye projects ever turn out exactly the same. But if your glue, like say you just glued it and it's really wet, the minute you go to try to put the dye on it, that's just gonna make this muddy mess. If it's kind of tacky, you could probably play with it and make it work. And then what'll happen is you'll get some of the dye will seep under where the glue is and it'll give maybe an antique look to it. So you determine if you just glued your fabric, I, I probably wouldn't. If it's tacky and almost dry, go ahead and give it a try. All right, and then one more quick thing before we get started. Um, I see a comment from somebody that says they didn't get any foam brushes in the kit. That is my fault for accidentally sending out a kit with no brushes in it. So Buffy, is there a way they can do this project without the brushes or? I can also send them out to you after the class and you can watch the, rewatch it and do it on your own. Um, but is there any way they could do it without the brushes if they have something at home? Well, you know, we're, we're all about STEM, right? So STEM, I think sometimes is trying to use the available resources that you have on hand. You know, what can we do to make something work? So maybe look around at home if you have paint brushes, uh, anything like that. So any kind of brush will, will work. We did the foam ones because they're easy to wash and clean up and they're also disposable if you guys didn't wanna keep them. But if you don't have any kind of a brush at all, uh, you can kind of make do and, and I'll, I'll play, with, play along with you on this. Um, so let's suppose no brushes. Um, you could maybe take some paper towel some of you might be laughing, but this is what I have readily available at, at, on hand. And I'm just folding it in quarters or halfing, halfing, halfing. I'm kind of creating my own brush like so. Now this is not gonna be as accurate as if I had a, a very fine pointed brush. So now I've kind of created a little brush that I can then dip and brush across. So I'll play with that a little bit later when I start doing the dye, uh, just to give you an option if you're, you know, you're ready to go, you have your dye mix and you don't have the foam brushes. So huge apology that one of the kits missed a brush. Um, hopefully that's the only one that that happened to, but you know, kind of improvise, see what you can come up with. Uh, cloth might work really well too, if you have an old rag or something that you want to fold and come up with and we'll, we'll see what happens. All right, and other questions that I see pop up, I am, I'm gonna try to get those to Buffy soon, but um, they don't seem like pressing questions to move forward. So I think we should go ahead and move forward with this. And then if we have time at the end, I'll get to some more of these questions. Okay, cool. Yeah, we should definitely have some time. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull my sleeves up a little bit just so that I don't you know, rake my sleeves across and through the die. So this is where we get to the fun part. You know, we've already got our pattern created and now we're gonna apply the dye to it. So there's no hard and fast rule for how the coloration needs to go. You know what your pattern is. Um, the one that I have here is a very free form style pattern. So I am gonna have to decide, you know, do I wanna do um, a free form with my dye or do I wanna be more exacting? So in the, the the example back here, 
there's some flowers. So I chose to do the chartreuse predominantly within the petals of the flower. And then out from there, the navy or the indigo dye. And then around from that, I did the robin egg blue. So that one was kind of more precise. So for the person who's improvising, that probably will not be a, a good fit for you. Whereas on this particular pattern, do you see how it's kind of a, an overall, like I put some, some robin's egg blue in some places, I put the navy uh, indigo dye in others, and then the chartreuse across a different section. So you kind of have to look at your pattern and assess. Uh, where this one's a free form, I'm probably going to continue and do just a free form dye. So it's tricky for me to do this sitting down. I want to stand up. Um, I'm going to actually take the part that's um, over the edge and I'm going to pull it even more over the edge so that I can be working a little bit where you guys can see and then I'll just gently move the, the fabric forward. So I'm going to start with my lightest color and that's usually a good rule of thumb because your darker colors are going to bleed into the lighter color. So my lightest color here is going to be that, that robin's egg blue. And I'm going to do just kind of a striped uh, formation on it. And you're just going to brush that in. So the idea being is we want to get our fabric where it is saturated, but not dripping. And we're going to actually flip our towel over and do both sides. So don't feel like you have to pour it on and get it so wet that it creates this huge pool of dye and makes a big mess. You're just kind of working the dye into the fabric and working it into your fibers. So I'm gonna switch for a second and test out the theory on the uh, non-foam brush. So I'm gonna choose to use the folded tip as opposed to the open, just so it stays together and maybe holds up a little bit longer. Um, it's not gonna be great, but I think you'll still be able to, um, you know, to get the dye in there. Um, your fingers are definitely gonna get dyed, so whomever the person is using the non-foam brush and improvising, you definitely might want to put the gloves on. So then you're just gonna kind of keep working. I might decide, okay, that's looking good there, and I'm gonna come down a little bit further and use the, the robin egg blue, and I'm just gonna create kind of a random pattern. Uh, this is where you can take a lot of detailed time if your pattern has more detail to it. So yeah, I think I think this is workable. It's not ideal, but it's workable. I was gonna say too, Camille, Camille I think is the one I didn't give the brush, brushes to. If you end up doing, um, if you improvise and use something other than the brush, let us email me and I'll get you um, a replacement kit with the brushes in it too. So then you can try it both ways since you didn't get the brushes. And so Buffy, when you're saying we can go into a little bit more detail, does that mean, so if we did um, like a very specific, like instead of, I didn't do a pattern, I did a drawing? Yeah, so you did a drawing on yours because I, I was privileged enough to see what others look like. So she actually hers of a bus. So let's say you want the wheels to be navy blue and you want the body of the bus to be um, the chartreuse green. Mm -hmm. Then you can actually stay within the lines and that's where you become more detailed in your pattern. Just like behind me, how the flowers are the chartreuse and then it kind of radiates out from there. But always start with your lighter color first because the dark colors will, will bleed in. And two things will happen is that bleeding that happens. And then secondly, if you contaminate your dark into your light, then your brush, you won't ever get the dark out of it unless you rinse it and wash it with soap and water. So do you see how I'm, I'm just kind of creating a random stripe effect across mine? And so this is where, you know, it'll take some time and we could actually, Heather, answer some of the questions while everybody's working on putting their dye on the front part of their. So somebody asked, do these dyes in their wet form have a limited time that they could be used? Can she, can they use their leftovers uh, at a different time? 
you can use your, you can come back and use your leftovers. You'll notice that we included a uh, lid for your dies, so they'll be sealed. So the couple of things that I've run into, and, and I've kept dies for a long time, I mean, for months, is you wanna, you know, keep them from freezing. So don't, you know, store them in a shed where they might freeze. And sometimes you'll pull your dye out and it's settled. There'll be like a little bit of the sediment at the bottom and just remix it back up, make sure it's at room temperature. And yes, you can definitely keep your dyes. And then did you wear gloves when treating the fabric with soda ash or is it safe for the skin? Also, where did you buy the urea? Uh, Dharma Trading and Amazon for the urea. In fact, any of those uh, you can get online. Dharma Trading is a wonderful resource because they also give you instructionals that go with each of the products. Uh, they tell you a little bit more information. So the dyes, which are Procyon dyes, the urea, and the soda ash, you can all order through Dharma Trading. And Amazon is a licensed dealer or care, I, I'm not sure of the terminology, but anyway, they, they carry Dharma through there and the prices are, are comparable for that. So as to the soda ash, it is definitely recommended that you wear gloves when playing around with it, just because it will start to dry the skin out over time. And where I do, typically when I do these projects, with groups, uh, probably the smallest group I do is about 20 people to, you know, the 300 that I prepped for our our classes today. So it will dry your skin out. You, you can use it without, but it definitely dries your skin out. Okay. Um, could you paint around the glue and then later when the glue is dry, paint it? Could you paint, you paint, oh, could you paint it around the glue? Uh, so I'm not sure. Oh, you must have a wet. I bet she has some wet uh, glue, and that's that's why. So you can try to. Again, remember that the glue is what is creating the resist, and the resist is the blocker. So you can try, but dye. Uh, so let me just give you an example. So if I if I tip mine up, do you see where I have a little splotch, a drop, and how far that little drop spread? So as careful as you think you might be trying to be with wet glue, that dye is gonna seep and it's gonna spread and it's gonna bleed throughout the fabric. Um, you know, it might be kind of fun to see what it would do, <laughs> but if you're really wanting to make sure that your pattern stays firm, I would just wait until your glue dries. And that's only gonna be a couple hours from now. So, Okay, so I'm switching to my second color and I'm gonna start working it in. So one of the things I wanna point out at this stage is like as I'm picking mine up, so from the back side, I can see the color, but it's not wet all the way through. Now on the front side, it's definitely wet, but then on my towel, I can barely feel. So I'm not getting it so wet that it's like this soppy mess. Um, so somebody asks, why are there two packages? I got yellow and gray. And I think they're probably um, referring to the one that is gray was to that lighter looking packet of paint. That's the, yeah, that's the Robin Egg Blue. You should have three different dye packets. And I pulled an extra kit just in case we had questions like that come up. And let me pull the, the dyes out so you guys can see what they look like in the powdered form. Okay. So inside of your kit, this is kind of that gray one I think that they're talking about. This is your robin egg blue. So that's that really bright blue right there. There's a greenish colored one which is chartreuse green. The color I just started to put on. And then that almost looks black, and that's a navy blue. All right, so again, I, I can't totally gauge what how everybody's doing, but just kind of keep working at your dye and you know, creating your pattern in batiking. 
you somebody, get your pattern. Somebody is saying that they only got two dies. So, so uh, that one would definitely be my fault then because I packed all the dies. Um, so um, first and foremost, I apologize that you only got two dies. So you're gonna have the two dies then probably if, if those are what you said, the, the gray and the, the green, these will be the two dye colors that you have to work with. If you want, uh, which will still send, give. We can send a packet later of the third one. Uh, you can just do a two color project. Um, you can email us for more, for more dyes later uh, if you want that third dye. So Heather, this would be a good thing for us to maybe make a note on that if we included in the kit a supply list, they could check their supplies prior to the video. Well, and then if they were short, we might have a little bit of lead time to get something out to them. Okay, yeah, that's a really good idea. I like that. So I don't know if you guys know, but this is our pilot program of this. And so- uh, Thank you for being you know, a part you guys of it. Are, <laughs> yeah, you guys get to be part of the pilot <laughs> to, see, to see how we do. If it's something that you guys like and, and are able to be engaged in and still feel like you walk away having gotten the information that you needed and good instruction. So feedback is also good. Yeah, I didn't All right, so I am just about ready. Survey, but um, feel free to, to message or to email us. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and switch to my third color. So basically what I've got going, I'm just doing kind of stripes on this particular one. But I'm going to go ahead and, and start filling in now with my, my dark color. And if you can see my dye over on the side, I haven't used a whole lot of it yet. So you're going to have extra dye to do some cool projects at home uh, if you want or to do some more dish towels. They make amazing gifts. So again, I'm working it into the fabric. I'm not just saturating the fabric with it, um, like so that it's messy, but I'm, I'm definitely making sure that the fabric is wet with the dye. Can you use washable white Elmer's glue or is just a blue gel washable? No, this is, a, so we have the, you should have gotten the white Elmer's glue in your kit. You can use either one. Yeah, so in your kit, we provided the washable Elmer's glue. Make sure it's the washable, not the glue all. And I've played around with both. At the beginning of our program, I showed you guys both the, uh, the gel glue, what it looks like, and then the washable. Both of them work really well. There's pros and cons on, on two ends there. The, the gel glue, the reason we didn't provide that for you is we couldn't get it in the size that we needed and it, it just wasn't available. And so we use the washable glue is what we put in the kits for you guys. I would say the only disadvantage to the washable glue is you're using it on weight. So sometimes as you're creating your pattern, it can be a little tricky to see. And the gel glue, the only disadvantage I would say with that is it's a little bit stiffer in the fabric. And so when you go to wash it out, you have to be a little more, um, use a little more of your own elbow grease or you know, wash it twice. And, and I'll get to that here in just a minute about how you're gonna finish off your project. All right, so somebody wants to know if they can use right dye, R-I-T. Um, do you know what that is, Buffy? Oh, right. Well, oh, maybe, they, yeah, is that the same as what is in the right. kit? I use right dye. Oh, right dye, okay, cool. Um, can it is not. Okay, not the same. Yeah, it's not the same. Okay. Can you No, so if you're going to use RIT, make sure you follow the directions on the on the dye packet. Can you mix the colors? Yeah. Um, in fact, a lot of times I will have um, different patrons at programs that we do, uh, depending on, now these three are pretty complementary colors, but if we have like yellows and reds, and so we start talking about secondary and tertiary colors. 
So in just a sec, I'm gonna be ready to flip my towel over and put the dye on the back side. And this is where sometimes you can get really creative. Like, let's just say I was using uh, yellow and I flipped it over and I added red to it. I would get the secondary color of orange. So these colors maybe don't mix are very complimentary, but yeah, you can absolutely mix the dyes. Have tons of fun with it. Okay, so brushing through, catching my edges. Um, so if you notice on this side here, I have barely begun to use my dye. All right, so here is side one, and now I'm gonna go ahead and flip it over and do the same on side two. So let's say I wanted to do a mix of colors without contaminating my dye vats, then maybe where the blue, the light blue robin egg is on the top, maybe I do chartreuse over the top, and then what happens is those dyes mix. So now I'm on the other side and I won't even use as much dye because half of my fabric's already fairly wet. Where it isn't is my borders. So I'm gonna come in and make sure that I get that layering on the other side. Oftentimes when I do dye projects with kids, their number one question, some of them, <laughs> Are, do I have to do both sides? Well, no, you don't have to do both sides, but by doing both sides, you're gonna make sure that you get a really beautiful, vibrant color. <laughs> so I encourage, encourage them to do both sides. Your dye will be a lot more faded and you won't get the brilliancy of color of the dye if you only do one side. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be boring and do the same color on both sides and not even play with the secondary tertiary, except for where the borders blend, which I think is kind of cool. Somebody wants to know where we get the flower sack towels. And then also maybe you could speak to what other kind of material you could do this on. So flower sack dish towels, great question. Uh, through the years, I've used a lot of different flower sack dish towels. They are not all made equal. So two major factors that come into play with the flower sack dish towel, and why we use flower sack dish towels is because they're 100% cotton. Natural fibers take the dye better. The dye is able to adhere to them better. So that's why we're using a flower sack dish towel. Some dish towels, the flower sack dish towels are made with a very loose weave. So they have a lower um, like stitch uh, seam count, basically thread count, not seam count, sorry. And what happens with those is they don't hold square. Like they get, they, they twist and they warp and they look really wrinkly uh, quickly. So you'll notice the quality as you start looking around. Uh, lots of stores will carry uh, flower sack dish towels, but not all are of equal quality. So these that you guys are using today, we actually ordered online through Amazon. And the brand, if you look at the tag, is Utopia. So it's kind of an inexpensive towel but it's a really good quality. I, I've ordered a lot of different ones in over the years and tried out different ones just to kind of play with them and see. So these, when you buy them in the bulk quantity priced out at about a dollar a towel, but they hold their form, they stay in their shape. Uh, they're a high enough uh, seam count that they take the dye really well. They don't get super wrinkly. So you can create really cool patterns on them. Uh, North 40, like a lot of times feed stores will carry them. Uh, most department stores will carry uh, some form of a flower sack dish towel that run anywhere from a dollar to $4 a piece. Other fabrics that you can use. 
So we chose this because we thought you guys would like that by the time that you're finished with your dye process and everything that you have a finished project. But I will a lot of times buy bolts of muslin or um, bleached muslin. And again, I try to get a little bit higher count on the fabric so that it's, it's a better quality. And I will use the dye on those. And then I've made, you know, pillows and drawstring bags and all sorts of different end projects out of, I typically work with cotton when I'm working uh, a lot with the kids and stuff. Silk is really beautiful, but it gets kind of pricey. Uh, again, with wool, same kind of thing. It's beautiful and gorgeous, but it, it gets a little bit pricier. One of the next projects that we have coming up that we're going to be uh, getting out the door to you guys is a rust dye project. And that one you'll be getting fabric and you'll be making a hot pad after we dye the fabric. So it'll be a, a similar to this in a two-part series, but I'll teach the dye process and then give you instructions to do the sewing pro uh, process at home. Um, Buffy, more questions. Um, somebody wants to know if they can leave white spots and somebody else asks if they have to dye the other side of their towel right away or if they can wait. Okay, so one of the things and I should have emphasized this right at the beginning, this is your project. So you're experimenting, you're playing around. No two projects are ever gonna look alike. So, um, you know, you get to kind of decide what you want to do with it in terms of, you know, creating, creating. It, it's that creative process. And you might find like the first time you do this and you learn the process that looking back, you're like, oh, I would do these things differently. So, you know, just recognize that right out the gate. This is your project and there isn't necessarily a right or wrong. It's the process of learning. Now in the right and wrong, there are certain steps like you need to mix the dyes the right way. And if you don't have the soda ash, then your dye is gonna be a lot more washed out and muted. So different um, choices that you make will obviously affect what that end project is and that end result. So the question being, do I have to put my second coat on right away? So you definitely wanna get the second coat on to maintain the vibrancy of color. Do you need to do it right away? So the reason why we work, um, and I'm kind of doing it fast right here because I know we have a, a timeline. You might take a long time to create, to create your dyes and, and add those in and be a lot more detailed. So I'm just doing it quickly so that I can answer questions and, and not spend a lot of time on that. But you wanna make sure that the fabric stays wet the entire time that you're working on it. Because once you're done, so now we're, we're on to the, the next and kind of final step of the dye process is I'm gonna take my piece and I'm gonna half it. Actually, I'll hold it up first just so you guys can see. Um, so this is what it looks like. I just did sort of that striped variation. You're gonna notice as you start to pick it up that that glue has gotten soft and it's getting sticky. So if you wait and come back to put that dye on later, you could have quite a sticky mess. If you're doing the wax, you have a little bit more forgiveness because the wax doesn't get gummy. So I've halved mine, halved it again, then I'm gonna half it like this and I'm gonna roll it up like a sleeping bag. And remember I had you guys at the very beginning, open your bag up with the edges down. Then you're gonna go ahead and set your project inside. So you want to make sure that your project stays moist. So I just twist mine like this and sometimes I'll even flip the ends over. I don't tie a knot because usually I have, you know, 30, 50 projects to undo and I get tired of untying the knot. So for me, I just twist and hold and then you're going to let that sit overnight. So in terms of whether you need to actually put the dye, the second coat on, I would say do it now rather than later, especially with the glue. The glue gets really gummy 
tacky, sticky, and it'll make a really big mess. And the goal is, is that you want to keep this, um, the dye wet. That's why we put it in the plastic and you're going to let it just sit overnight. So like, you know, 12 hours, 24 hours, um, then you're going to pull it out of the bag and you're going to wash it. I typically just stick it in my wash machine on a quick wash cycle. I make sure that my water is warm to hot and I put a little bit of soap in it to, to agitate it and it rinses out. And then you have this amazing dyed flower sack at the end. So this one, I just washed through one cycle. It's a little bit stiff. So I'm gonna actually wash it a second time because I wanna take the stiffness out of it. If you are a little nervous about running the dye through your washer, like mine has a silver, you know, a stainless drum in the inside, so it never dies. But you can hand wash it in your sink and just know that what you're trying to do is remove the glue out of out of your project. I'm not sure if that prompted more questions or not. Um, but essentially, you're gonna keep it in the bag for you know about 12 hours. If you can't keep it that long, it's not a big deal. I just usually know that the I just put it in overnight and the next day, like I might wash this in the morning. And once I wash it, I pull it out, I let it dry, and there's your finished flower sack dish towel. Somebody asked if you heat set it. I don't because the soda ash created the mordant that locked in the dye. Okay. Um, can you wash it in a sink? Like you have to put it through the washer or can you do it in like a just hot water? You can absolutely tap water in the sink, you know, and just, just wash it out. You're just washing the glue out. And uh, so the thing to remember there, you know, maybe don't have dirty dishes because then <laughs> they're going to get dyed. Uh, but yeah, you can wash it in the sink. You can wash it in a five gallon bucket. You could do it in a little tub. I generally don't just have one to do. So I just throw them all in the wash machine together. Perfect. Um, I don't see any other, oh, actually, let me open the question back up. Um, how long do you have to wash it in the sink for? Do you need all the dye to run clear? So I don't think that there is a specific time. It's mostly that you want the dye to run clear and you want the gumminess of the glue to go away. So, you know, if you don't want to run your hot water tank out of hot water, what I would probably do is I would first put it in like, not like either I would uh, put a stopper in the sink and I would let it kind of soak a little bit in there and agitate it with a little bit of detergent so that I'm, I'm working through that and then let that drain and then you can kind of assess and see how much glue is left in your, your piece and then kind of repeat that a couple of times. I'm gonna bet it's gonna take about six or seven times to repeat it if you're hand washing. Um, the leftover dye, I think you said that was good for months. It is. Um, okay, so leftover dye. So one of the things you're gonna wanna do is, you know, squish out your brushes. I am going to, because I don't have a sink right here handy, but what I, what you're going to do is you're just going to kind of squish your brushes out like this. And then I actually just wash my brushes up with uh, soap and water. I intentionally try to leave some of the color on the, the wooden shaft because then that way I know that this is the one I'm always going to use with chartreuse. So I've got my chartreuse one and then I'm going to go ahead and put my sealed lid on. So the dye will dry out if you don't have it in a sealed container. And then I'm just gonna do that the same for all of them so that I don't accidentally tip them over and make a big mess. I am prone to do that sometimes. I mean, I don't, I don't think that this will end exactly at three, but just in case I'm wrong, uh, thanks everybody. Um, it's 2.59, if you have to go, I wanna be um, considerate of everybody's time and it's almost three, so if you have to go, um, feel free to email us questions or um, rewatch this on Facebook Live. And um, if if not, Buffy and I will stick around for a couple more minutes after three. Um, like I said, unless the Zoom just automatically ends. Uh, we really appreciate all your comments. Um, I see a lot of people are really enjoying this. I'm really glad. That's awesome to hear. And definitely. Uh, email one of us and let us know if uh, you're missing a piece of your kit and we'll get that to you.
and I'm, but yeah, we'll stick around for more questions and I'm gonna go through um, so far. Huge thank you to everybody for, for zooming in and joining us. Um, we're excited to see, you know, how this program goes and hopefully if it's well received, we'll, we'll try to continue having more programs like this.